Forum, and the Secretary of the Committee, Mr. Kurt Garrigan from the Environment and Development Division at ESCA. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, good morning and welcome to the sixth session of the Committee on Environment and Development. Before we begin, on behalf of the Secretariat, I would like to provide some housekeeping announcements related to the platform we're using. Today's committee is held in a hybrid format. While the Secretariat and some representatives of member states are present in the ESCAP hall, most participants are connected virtually via CUDO. In case you have any technical issues, please consult the technical guide that was circulated prior to the meeting and reach out to the technical operators if required. The remote simultaneous interpretation of the proceedings is provided by the United Nations for the purpose of facilitating communication in light of the fact that there are six official languages of the United Nations. Participants are requested to be mindful of the additional difficulties experienced by interpreters when working in remote mode and of the increased likelihood of disruptions to the audio feed to the interpreters. Only the speech or the intervention in the original language is authentic and constitutes an authentic record of the proceedings. In case of any inconsistency between the interpretation and the speech or intervention in the original language, the latter shall prevail. Interpreter service in remote meetings cannot be held liable for an interruption of service, pixelation, freezing, or loss of visual input, partial or complete loss of audio, audible artifacts, unauthorized access to personal or confidential data, leaking of information due to inadequate soundproofing and or data loss. As mentioned in the technical guide, to request the floor, please click on the request to speak blue button on your KUDO page and wait until your request is approved. Once your request is approved, your microphone and camera will be off by default. Please turn them on by clicking on unmute and camera on. With mic on and camera on, you have the floor. Once your intervention is over, please click on release mic in order to give the floor to others. We kindly request that the chat function be used only for technical questions and concerns. Let me now hand over the floor to the chair of the fifth session of the Committee on Environment and Development to provide his introductory remarks and officially open the forum. Mr. Wangdi, the floor is yours. Excellency, Madam Executive Secretary, Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasure to extend a warm welcome to all delegates to the opening session of the sixth session of the Committee on Environment and Development. It is nice to meet you all and to know that you are safe and sound in these difficult times. It was indeed my great honor to have served as the chair of the fifth session of the Committee on Environment and Development, which was held in Bangkok, Thailand from 21st to 23rd November 2018. Since the fifth session of the committee convened to review current and emerging environment trends and challenges in the region, we have seen the outbreak of COVID-19 pandemic, which has highlighted the urgent need to place the health of our planet firmly on our agenda. The fifth session of the committee built on the outcomes of the seventh ministerial conference on environmental and development. And it is important to note that the sub-program on environment and development continued to contribute to achieving objectives in the ministerial declaration uh, on environment and development for Asia and Pacific 2017. We appreciate the work carried out by the Secretariat to continue to meet these objectives through analysis and assistance to member states to develop environmental policies and actions and to accelerate progress with respect to environmental dimensions of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and goals of the Paris Climate Agreement. The fifth session of the committee recognized increasing environmental impacts such as transboundary impacts from marine, air and water pollution and plastic waste, land degradation and loss of biodiversity, unsustainable consumption of natural resources, declining ocean health, and climate change induced disasters, especially in coastal lowland cities and low elevation coastal settlements. In response, the committee encouraged ESCAP and other partners to, one, extend further collaborations and technical support to translate policies into action. Two, 
to build capacities in evidence-based decision-making on natural resources. Three, to share good practices and learning. Four, to develop and utilize environmentally friendly technologies. And lastly, to access new and innovative forms of financing to build capacity at local level of all stakeholders. I'm pleased to note that the member states have since the committee meeting responded to these priorities, including in their own commitments to address climate change and through support to raise the ambitions in nationally determined contributions. Member states also came together to adopt a resolution at the 75th session commission session to strengthen regional cooperation to tackle air pollution and the 76th commission session focused on protecting the ocean. I commend the Secretariat for continuing efforts to support countries to address regional environmental challenges. It continues to build the capacities of countries to develop and implement ambitious climate actions and also co-organized with the UNFCCC, the United Nations Environment Program, and other agencies, the Asia Pacific Climate Weeks for both 2018 and 2019. The Secretariat has worked with governments and other UN agencies to help celebrate the first International Day of Clean Air for Blue Skies and to mainstream technical solutions to address the increasingly common impacts of air quality. The Secretariat continues to raise awareness of the environment, including through the Asia Pacific Day for Ocean, development of technical solutions to reduce marine plastics and inputs to the UN Decade of Ocean Science. The Secretariat organized the seventh Asia Pacific Urban Forum in October 2019 in Penang, Malaysia, and developed regional guide guidance to, pro to promote sustainable urban solutions for future cities of Asia and the Pacific. We must keep this attention on the environment and continue to support countries as we move forward, including to ensure that recoveries from the pand pandemic place high priority on environment and lead us to a green, resilient and inclusive Asia Pacific region. As the chair of the fifth committee on environment and development, I would like to thank all member states and the secretary for their commitment and look forward to deliberations during the sixth session of the committee. I thank you. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure now to invite Mrs. Ms. Armida Salshia Aziz Jabani, Under Secretary General of the United Nations and Executive Secretary of UNSCAP, to deliver her welcome address. Madam, you have the floor. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen. A warm welcome to all delegations to the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific, as well as those joining remotely from capitals to the sixth session of the Committee on Environment and Development. The committee convenes at a very consequential point in time. We could not have anticipated two years ago when the committee last met that we would be meeting during a global COVID-19 pandemic that has exposed some of our greatest environmental challenges. The COVID-19 pandemic has had far-reaching impacts across the Asia-Pacific region and beyond. <laughs> While much of the attention has been properly focused on protecting the health of population, as well as the social impacts and on the economic recoveries that are needed, we must also understand and address the environmental roots of the pandemic if we are to reduce the risk of future pandemics. Today, our region is going through great transformation with the changing patterns of development, resource consumption, energy use, and CO2 emissions. These changing factors are adversely affecting biodiversity and the environment. 
threatening planetary health and jeopardizing our ability to achieve the new urban agenda, the Paris Climate Agreement and the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. As we recover better together, the future of our region is fundamentally tied to success or failure in stewardship of the environmental system and response to the climate change challenge. In this case, ESCAP's scenario building, building work shows that business as usual is likely to drive significant tensions between and within countries, climate migration, inequality, and hardship. With the post-2020 biodiversity framework taking shape, the decade of ocean science before us, the need to accelerate climate action and progress towards the sustainable development goals, we can no longer defer cooperation on the environment. With this background, may I now focus on the following policy priorities for your consideration and further guidance. First, raising climate ambition. The committee provides an important opportunity in realizing environmental benefits through climate actions. The commitments being made by member states across our region to significantly to significant emission reductions, net zero emissions, and carbon neutrality are encouraging, but still not enough. More ambitious mitigation pathways can be achieved including increasing energy efficiency of industry and cities by 60 to 70 percent, decarbonization of electricity, and electrification of energy and use, deep reductions in agricultural emissions, and advancing carbon cap capture, carbon storage, and sequestration measures. I would like to urge governments to incorporate these policy measures in an integrated, holistic, and cost-effective manner in their national mitigation and adaptation plans, establishing voluntary carbon pricing instruments and taxes, fossil fuel subsidy reforms, national and regional emission trading systems, and national private climate finance will secure and mobilize the needed financial support. Second, SAF safeguarding ecosystem health. Ecosystem health can be achieved through the protection of biodiversity and ecosystems. The restoration of degraded ecosystems, ensuring sustainable consumption and production patterns, and by preventing pollution, to name just a few. The third Asia Pacific Day for the Ocean, held in October 2020, highlighted the urgent need to sustainably manage marine resources to address marine plastics and to enhance regional cooperation to protect our ocean. Let me highlight that tourism and fisheries, marine pollution, sustainable maritime connectivity and ocean, data and statistics are four specific areas of transformative actions for ocean protection and sustainable development. Third, clean air for all. Transboundary air pollution is a regional problem that requires regional solutions and regional cooperation. We must mobilize effective solutions such as innovative approaches to data, including satellite imagery and machine learning, and proactively engage with decision makers at all levels to meaningfully reduce air pollution. The regional conversation series on air pollution in Asia Pacific on the commemoration of the first International Day of Clean Air for Blue Skies re-emphasize the need to mobilize effective solutions as outlined above through regional cooperation. In this context, there is also a need to promote appropriate agricultural machinery that can help farmers adopt sustainable and integrated management of straw residue. Technology and innovation, including mechanization-based solutions, through the Center for Sustainable Agricultural Mechanization, or CSAM, have a key role to play to reduce residue burning in some parts of the region. Fourth, cities for a sustainable future. Despite the disruption to our urban centers from the pandemic, cities remain vitally important to our planetary ecosystem, and changing urban-rural dynamics will impact biodiversity, emissions, and air pollution. Without doubt, the region's cities are central to recoveries that build back better. To guide future, future urbanization, ESCAP's Future of Asian and Pacific Cities report provides thematic priorities and solution pathways for a more sustainable urban future. 
I'm confident that well-planned and sustainable urbanization provides opportunity to contribute to environmental value by leveraging smart data and technologies, innovative land-based finance, sustainable settlement patterns, investment in nature-based resilience building, environment-related improvements to health and well-being, and resource efficiencies. Excellencies, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, I'm certain that addressing the regional environmental challenges outlined above will require harnessing regional cooperation and solutions-oriented proposals. A shared narrative for the future of our region's environment is essential and will require mobilizing member states and stakeholders to avoid, to avoid future risk. ESCAP, along with the UN system, stands ready to work with member states, local and sub-national authorities, international and regional organizations, civil society and the private sector to accelerate innovative solutions to critical environmental challenges. I urge member states to consider opportunities before the committee to support and scale up our collective work on the environment by strengthening the implementation of existing multilateral environmental agreements and intergovernmental processes and mobilizing the region's technical expertise. Furthermore, a proposal for the committee to establish a technical expert group to work with the Secretariat is before you, and we are confident that this enhanced dialogue will further strengthen regional cooperation to build back better and advance the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. The urgency of environmental action has never been more profound. I wish you a very successful committee session. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Excellency, for your warm and welcoming words and the good work done in the region. Now we'll hear from uh, Ms. Joyce Musia, Deputy Executive Director of the United Nations Environment Program, and she is connected remotely. Madam Joyce, you have the screen. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, Mr. Wang Di, Chair of the fifth session of the Committee on Environment and Development. Uh, greetings, Ms. Armida Alisja Bana, Under Secretary General of ESCAP, Excellencies, Ladies and Gentlemen. I am delighted to join you this morning in this very important uh, meeting. The task that lies before us is monumental. The East Asia and Pacific region could see at least 11 million more people falling into poverty this year because of the pandemic. Economic losses are expected to reach as high as US dollars 2.5 trillion. Bouncing back from this alone is a deeply daunting task that we face a series of interlinked emergencies. In addition to the pandemic, the planet is heating up and the natural world is unraveling at breakneck speed. Today's emissions gap report paints a bleak picture. We are heading for a world that is 3.2 degrees centigrade hotter by the end of this century. And that's true even if all unconditional nationally determined contributions under the Paris Agreement are fully met. The consequences are grim. And the destruction of the living world not only undermines our only life support system, it makes pandemics more likely. And yet, as nations seek ways to recover from the pandemic, I see immense opportunity. I see a real chance, perhaps our best yet, to avert climate catastrophe and reverse the destruction of the living world. I see a once in a lifetime opportunity to transform our economies and societies at the speed and scale we need. To succeed, the vast st stimulus packages being mobilized by governments must be spent on building back green, not squandered on industries that damage the environment. 
As the Secretary General has made crystal clear, a green recovery from COVID-19 means ending fossil fuel subsidies, making polluters pay for their pollution, tying public bailouts to green jobs, and driving the shift to a green economy. It is vital that governments also invest heavily in nature as part of this recovery. Not only do nature-based solutions to the climate crisis reverse ecological destruction, they also mitigate and protect against future pandemics. I am built by some of the work already being done in this region. The countries of the acid deposition network in East Asia recently decided to bring air quality and air pollution issues into their scope of work. This is excellent, and I know UNEP will continue to support their efforts. We also held the first International Day of Clean Air for Blue Skies in September. Interest in establishing a regional mechanism on air quality is really encouraging. Let us take that up with vigor. We can also build on a biodiversity bright spot. The UN Biodiversity Summit held at the conclusion of the General Assembly this year proved to be a remarkable moment for nature. More than 100 heads of states and governments identified biodiversity, conservation and financing as vital to the planet's interest. Let us translate this momentum into a stronger post-2020 biodiversity framework. We urgently need to raise our ambition in the vital months leading up to COP15 next May in Kunmin. I am pleased to inform you that given the COVID-19 pandemic, the fifth session of the United Nations Environment Assembly, UNEA 5, will follow two-step approach. Step one, in February 2021, in virtual way, to review and adopt UNEP medium-term strategy and biannual budget. Step two is postponed to February 2022 to integrate into the celebrations of UNEP at 50 that commemorations of the creation of UNEP. I invite all countries in Asia and the Pacific to bring ambition and aspiration to the fourth session of the Forum of Ministers and Environment Authorities of Asia Pacific scheduled to be held in October 2021 in Republic of Korea, which will lead into the next United Nations Environment Assembly. The scale of relief and recovery packages underway around the world is unprecedented. These resources will shape the direction of economies and societies for decades to come. So it is vital that we get this right. We cannot allow ourselves to slide back into business as usual, because business as usual means global heating, it means the destruction of the natural world, and it means the deep injustices and unimaginable suffering this entails for millions of people around the world. Instead, we need to transform our societies at a speed and scale unprecedented in human history. In their response to the pandemic, governments have shown that they can mobilize vast resources when faced with an emergency. Now we must ensure they do not waste them. Get this wrong and generations will suffer the consequences. I wish you successful deliberations. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Madam. Uh, thank you for your clear assessment uh, of the climate uh, emergency and the need for scaled up climate action on the ground, especially uh, in the region. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, continuing with our agenda, we now move to the election of officers of the Bureau. In view of the outbreak of COVID-19, and the special circumstances of this year's committee, I propose that the Bureau comprise of a single chair and two vice chairs. May I now open the floor for any nominations for the positions of the chair and two vice chairs.
The floor is open for nominations. I recognize the distinguished delegate from Nepal. Mr. Chair, my delegation has the honor in proposing the following delegates to serve on the Bureau for the Sixth SCAP Committee on Environment and Development. As Chair, Her Excellency, Mrs. Suchitra Durai, Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary and Permanent Representative of India to SCAP, as Vice Chairs, Mr. Oleg Samanov, Minister Councillor, Deputy Permanent Representative of the Russian Federation to SCAP, and Mr. Deki Kumar, Deputy Permanent Representative of the Republic of Indonesia to SCAP. My delegation is confident that the distinguished delegates who have been nominated will discharge their duties efficiently and effectively for the successful deliberations of the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, distinguished delegate from Nepal. The distinguished delegate from Nepal has nominated Her Excellency, Mrs. Suchitra Durai, Ambassador and Permanent Representative of India to ESCAP as chair of the sixth session of the Committee on the Environment and Development, and Mr. Oleg Shamanov, Minister Council, Deputy Permanent Representative of the Russian Federation to ESCAP and Mr. Diki Komar, Deputy Permanent Representative of the Republic of Indonesia to ESCAP as Vice Chairs. Would any delegation wish to second the nomination? I recognize the distinguished delegate from Timor-Leste. Timor-Leste, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My delegation has the honor in second, seconding the nomination which have just been proposed by the distinguished delegate of Nepal for the various video positions for the sixth SCAP Committee on Environment and Development. My delegation has fully confidence in the proposed bill in discharging their duty for successful deliberation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, distinguished delegate from Timor Leste. I have the pleasure to formally announce the Bureau of the sixth session of the Committee on Environment and Development that is composed of the following. As Chair, Her Excellency, Mrs. Suchitra Durai, Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary and Permanent Representative of India to UN SCAP. As Vice Chairs, Mr. Oleg Shamanov, Minister Council, Deputy Permanent Representative of the Russian Federation to UNSCAP, and Mr. Diki Kumar, Deputy Permanent Representative of the Republic of Indonesia to UNSCAP. I congratulate the officers of the Bureau for their election. It is now my honor to invite Her Excellency Mrs. Suchitra Durai, Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary and Permanent representative of India to UNSCAP to conduct this meeting in representation, representation of the Bureau of this meeting from this point onwards. Your Excellency, you have the screen. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it is indeed an honor and privilege for me to serve as chair of this important committee. 
For myself and on behalf of the other members of the Bureau, I wish to express our appreciation to the distinguished representatives for the confidence that you have reposed in us. The COVID-19 outbreak has challenged all of us to do business differently, as evident from this year's organization of the committee. We have a compact agenda ahead of us. I'm confident that together with member states and the spirit of cooperation and involvement of all distinguished delegates, I, as chair of this sixth session of the Committee on Environment and Development, will be able to ensure that the meeting produces meaningful outcomes. I wish to thank the Secretariat for its organization of the committee, and I'm sure we can count on its continued good work. I would like to express particular appreciation uh, to the chair of the fifth committee on environment and development, uh, His Excellency Mr. Sonam Bangdi, for his very effective chairmanship, uh, the executive secretary, Ms. Alice Jabana, and Ms. Masuya for their thoughtful messages during the opening session. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, let us now take up agenda item 1C, the adoption of the agenda, as presented to you in document SCAP slash CED slash 2020 slash L1. Are there any comments on this document? I see none. So if there are no comments, the agenda as contained in document SCAP CED slash 2020 slash L1 is adopted. Excellencies, Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for your cooperation in adopting the agenda of the sixth session of the Committee on Environment and Development. We will now move on to the next agenda item, agenda item two, environment and development in the aftermath of COVID-19 pandemic in Asia Pacific. Excellencies, Ladies and gentlemen, we will now address agenda item two, environment and development in the aftermath of the coronavirus disease pandemic in the Asia Pacific region. And the documents pertinent to this agenda item are before you, which comprise the environmental challenges related to the coronavirus disease pandemic in the Asia Pacific region, document SCAP slash CED slash 2020 slash one, and document titled The Role of Sustainable Mechanization in Addressing the Impact of the Coronavirus Disease on Agriculture and in Building Resilience, which is SCAP slash CED slash 2020 slash INF slash one. The committee will consider the impact of the coronavirus disease pandemic on the environment as well as possible responses to reduce environmental risk and strengthen resilience, including through climate action and green growth. The committee will also consider how recovery efforts can advance progress in the Asia Pacific region in implementing the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and in achieving the Sustainable Development Goals through a transition towards more sustainable resilient and inclusive societies. I'm confident that discussion in this session will provide a space to identify the environmental concerns related to the pandemic and highlight the need for better environmental management to support recoveries and long-term resilience strategies. This session is structured as follows. We will start with a short presentation by the Secretariat, introducing the theme of the session, followed by a keynote presentation by Dr. Sonali Senaratna Selamuttu, 
country representative, Integrated Water Management Institute, Southeast Asia and Myanmar. Afterwards, I will open the floor for statements. Participants are requested to hold off requesting for the floor until then. To start the session, I would like to welcome Ms. Katinka Weinberger, Chief of the Environment and Policies Section, Environment and Development Division of ESCAP. Madam, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair, for giving me the floor to speak, um, to introduce the theme Environment and Development in the Aftermath of the Coronavirus Disease Pandemic in the Asia Pacific Region. And a very good morning to all our distinguished participants. Could I have the first slide, please? Globally, the emergence of zoonosis, uh, diseases transmitted from animal species to humans is on the rise. We know that uh, zoonosis now make up approximately 60% of all known infectious diseases and 75% of new infectious diseases in humans. There is no doubt at all that the increasing emergence is due to human-mediated factors. Humans have significantly altered three quarters of the world's terrestrial ecosystems and dedicated more than a third of land area to crop or livestock production. The area and the quality of natural forests, wetlands and other ecosystems are rapidly declining. And as the second figure on this slide shows, land use changes resulting from agricultural expansion, logging, infrastructure development and other human activities is the most common driver um, of infectious disease emergence. This is because these changes increase the interface and the rate of contact between humans, domestic animals, and wildlife populations. I think we're all aware by now that a single zoonotic outbreak incurs trillions of US dollars in costs. Zoonotic diseases impact everyone. Therefore, addressing the drivers of zoonosis and finding solutions to protect the health of our planet must be a shared responsibility. Next slide, please. But how can we achieve this? How can we restore a sustainable relationship between nature and human societies to avoid future zoonosis? What are the drivers and which actions can address them? To find answers to these questions, we require holistic and interdisciplinary approaches. Two such approaches are One Health and Planetary Health, where One Health focuses on the prevention of risks and the mitigation of effects of crisis that originate at the interface between humans, animals, and the various environments, while planetary health looks at the same issues, but also incorporates the notion of the carrying capacity of ecosystems. Planetary health is defined as the health of human civilization and the state of the natural systems on which it depends. And I think what's really crucial is that at the center of both approaches is the understanding that ecosystem services are central. They're central to the health of humans, animals, and our planet. And as our background document highlights, planetary health is a useful framework for the development, implementation, and assessment of integrated policies. Policies that address the linkages between the health of the natural world and human health, and within the limits of what nature can provide and in alignment with the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Next slide, please. There is really considerable scientific evidence that the changes to the structure and the function of the Earth natural system is a substantial threat to global human health. And that this threat will become increasingly severe if we don't take steps to remedy the situation. For example, mangroves, coral reefs, and other types of wetland reduce the damage from tsunamis and storm surges. Their destruction has a direct impact on the number of lives affected by extreme weather events. Examples of other direct health effects include heat waves, water shortage, exposure to ultraviolet radiation, or exposure to pollutants. 
And other effects of global environmental change include yield losses, disease transition, and losses due to a lost livelihood opportunities, displacement, and conflict. Next slide, please. So different strategies are available at national level that promote a greener, more equal and resilient future and mitigate the impacts of environmental degradation on human health. And they're described in our paper. So I won't go into them in detail here, but I would like to emphasize that in the short term, and we've heard this in the, in, um, the um, statement by um, Ms. Masuya also earlier today, greening the recovery, greening recovery packages is essential. COVID-19 government stimulus packages should be spent in line with existing national environmental and climate objectives and recovery plans should at least maintain, if not strengthen, existing environmental standards and policies related to climate change, air and water pollution, biodiversity loss and other environmental changes. Next slide, please. I think it's clear that ecosystems ignore national boundaries and protecting and sustainably managing ecosystems must therefore be a shared responsibility at regional level. Regional collaboration is therefore essential for managing our shared environmental resources, including on the region's protected areas, wildlife trade, sustainable food systems and climate ambition. Next slide, please. In closing, let me say that the COVID-19 pandemic has underscored the importance of strengthening and accelerating an environmental action. And it is high time to restore a sustainable relationship between nature and human societies, both globally as well as here in the region. Given this context, the Committee on Environment and Development may wish to provide guidance to the Secretariat on opportunities to use the planetary health framework as a guide for national and regional strategies and also to provide further guidance on activities and programs in support of a green COVID-19 recovery. Please allow me to close by quoting the Secretary General of the UN who has said, science is screaming to us that we are closing to running out of time, close to running out of time, approaching a point of no return for human health, which depends on planetary health. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, uh, Mr. Weinberger, for your very useful presentation, elaborating the concept of uh, planetary health, and of course, emphasizing the importance of uh, regional approaches and dealing with this very important issue. We will now hear from Dr. Sonali Senaratna Selamuttu from the International Water Management Institute for Southeast Asia. Dr. Sonali, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to first thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity today. And I'm really delighted to be able to join this session and to speak to you very briefly on the topic of building back better in the Asia Pacific region in the aftermath of the COVID-19 pandemic. As we know, pandemics represent an existential threat to health and welfare of people across the planet. COVID-19 has been a good example of this and has highlighted the critical importance of the relationship between people and nature. And one of the key lessons that we've learned is that the COVID-19 pand pandemic is that human, animal and plant health are interdependent and interrelated and that it is really critical for us to do more to protect the diversity of life. While current pandemic strategies rely on responding to diseases after their emergence with public health measures and technological solutions, overall, in terms of responding to the pandemic, 
it really does provide us also with the unique opportunity of stepping back and thinking of a more transformative change. And it's essential to, to realize that it's not only the medical responses and the economic stimuli that we need, but it is very critical that we invest more in the health of our planet. In the UN SCAP background document that has been uh, shared with you and presented by Katinka, uh, aligned with the principles of planetary health and sustainable development, as she mentioned, there are several national strategies that can be adopted to help safeguard ecosystems in the transition towards more sustainable and resilient and inclusive societies. I will just focus and give provide three examples uh, that are uh, just to drill down a little bit and provide some uh, ideas of what some of these strategies could mean in, in context. So for example, in terms of focusing on a green economic recovery in the context of COVID-19. Building green and resilient economic systems in which the value of nature is included would be absolutely essential and vital in terms of human health and well-being as well as environmental health. And to achieve this, several international organizations and the Intergovernmental uh, Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, the Asia Pacific uh, Regional Assessment, particularly, as well as the Global Assessment, have recognized the role of nature based solutions for contributing to biodiversity conservation as well as overall climate change adaptation and mitigation. The International Union for the Conservation of Nature, or IUCN, defines nature-based solutions as, quote, actions to protect, sustainably manage, and restore natural or modified ecosystems that address societal challenges effectively and adaptively and simultaneously provide human well-being and biodiversity benefits. Nature-based solutions have been included in the draft of the post-2020 global biodiversity framework to be considered by the parties of the convention for the CBD. Nature-based solutions are an integral part of the green urban agenda and post-COVID pandemic responses will create a demand for investment in green spaces and quality of life outcomes linked to innovative green design, which support both density and healthy environments. COVID-19 has clearly shown us the importance of green urban spaces, particularly in populous, dense cities. During uh, the COP13 of the Ramsar Convention, the wetland city accreditation was introduced, which recognized 18 cities that have taken exceptional steps to safeguard their urban wetlands. In uh, Sri Lanka, for example, with the assistance and support of uh, my institute, the International Water Management Institute, which is one of the international, international organization partners of the Ramsar Convention, Colombo was honored as one of the first of the 18 Ramsar wetland city uh, accreditation sites. It was the only capital city selected, and this was therefore a landmark achievement. This kind of accreditation also provides opportunities for cross country and regional learnings through the planning and design in other cities. For example, we have held workshops and meetings 
with uh, to highlight the success story of Colombo's urban uh, wetlands together with other countries in the region and provided lessons on green infrastructure concepts, the practicalities of implementation and the potential opportunities for these other cities. So this kind of exchange and lesson learning between different cities would be important in the post recovery stage. Research in Asia by uh, the International Water Management Institute has highlighted also the value of wet urban wetlands in the context of the poor. For example, in the city of Hyderabad in India, there is a support of growing of rice, vegetables and cattle fodder that is sold in city markets that serves as livelihood opportunities for subsistence farmers and these kinds of opportunities become all the more important in the post pandemic recovery phase. Now moving on to another example, uh, the transition of to a more sustainable food system to more sustainable food systems. One of the challenges for the post COVID-19 recovery will be to accelerate investment in agricultural produ production while minimizing negative impacts on the environment, as well as building resilience of the farming systems. Some examples of this are, for, for example, uh, solar powered irrigation, which provide climate resilience and food security. And in this context, uh, areas that benefit uh, climate action, poverty reduction, as well as food, food uh, security. In another example of some work that we are currently doing on the solar irrigation for agriculture resilience in South Asia, this aims to sustainably manage water, energy, and climate interlinkages in South Asia through the promotion of solar irrigation pumps. And this contributes to climate resilient, gender equitable, and socially inclusive agrarian livelihoods in a number of countries in South Asia. This covers Bangladesh, uh, India, Nepal, and Pakistan. And by supporting government efforts to promote solar irrigation, this project responds to government commitments to transition to clean energy pathways in agriculture. All these countries where the, uh, have, that have project sites have NDC commitments to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and solar irrigation pumps can play a significant role in reducing emissions in agriculture. Quickly moving on to a final example, which is focused on moving from biodiversity conservation to agrobiodiversity management. In this example, I'd like to highlight that while conventional con conservation efforts have tended to focus on establishing protected areas. While these remain important, we need to remember that these alone, protected areas alone, will not be adequate. So for example, in the Asia Pacific region, there has been an increase in protected areas, both terrestrial and marine protected areas. For example, according to the IPES Asia Pacific regional assessment between 2004 and 2017 there was an increase of 0.3 percent of terrestrial for, for terrestrial protected areas and 13.8 percent for coastal and marine protected areas however what we need to note is that it is also important to look at the role of multifunctional landscape as important in contributing to the management and conservation of biodiversity. 
And this has been already recognized in the third conference of parties of the CBD that promotes the implementation of long-term coordination approaches to improve management of agricultural biodiversity. One such initiative is in Lao PDR, where the Agrobiodiversity Initiative, or TABI, is a long-term program of the Ministry of Agriculture and Forestry of the Government of Laos. And the goal of this program is to raise the status and integrate agrobiodiversity as a key component in the development policies, practices, and scenarios of the country. Moving forward, in terms of policy, Policymakers in the Asia, Asia Pacific region, it is important to consider leveraging the work of the biodiversity related conventions that countries in the region are party to. They provide vital contributions to building back better, preventing emergence of future pandemics, and to a holistic One Health approach for people, health, and environment. The importance of increasing commitment to the implementation of biodiversity related conventions as part of a holistic approach to addressing global challenges of biodiversity, climate change, land degradation, and building back better after COVID-19 should be taken into consideration. In conclusion, the pandemic should not be remembered only as a human tragedy, but it's important juncture, I think, for us to reconsider priorities for us as individuals and recognize this, that safeguarding the health and well-being of the current and future generation is intricately linked to safeguarding the health of our biodiversity ecosystems and our natural resources. And with this, I'd like to wrap up. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Sonali, for those uh, very useful insights on building back better and those uh, very uh, interesting examples that you highlighted uh, in your presentation. I will now open the floor for statements representatives of member states, associate member states and observer countries, major groups and other stakeholders and international organizations may request the floor using the request to speak button. I kindly remind everyone to limit their intervention to no longer than two minutes in length to allow all participants the opportunity to speak. So uh, we already have uh, a number of participants who have requested for the floor. So may I now begin uh, with Malaysia. I request the distinguished delegate of Malaysia to take the floor. All right. I don't know. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Please go ahead. Okay. Uh, Madam Chairperson, thank you very much. Um, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, since this is the first time Malaysia takes the floor, on behalf of the Malaysian government, I would like to congratulate UNSCAP for hosting and making this meeting possible. And thank you for inviting us to be part of this important meeting. Uh, as all countries are vigorously fighting the COVID-19 pandemic, it is important to ensure environmental health is not compromised. We must acknowledge the linkages between ecosystems health and human health. Hence, it is crucial to address the pressing issues of unsustainable development and socioeconomic activities and their impact on the environment and biodiversity. The pandemic has affected our daily norms and livelihoods and disrupted economic activities. The lockdown measure is quite effective in controlling the spread of the pandemic and to some extent has improved the air quality. However, this is not a practical long-term solution. 
In order to build back better, as well as enhance economic sustainability and resilience, it is vital to implement a robust green recovery strategy with multi-pronged measures that control the spread of the pandemic, allow socioeconomic activities to run, sustain people's livelihood and safeguard the environmental health. This can be achieved by adopting the planetary health approach. With this in mind, for the next five years, Malaysia has identified strategies to advance the green growth agenda in the country. And these include transition to a circular economy, promoting green cities, energy, mobility and market, prioritizing environmental health, enhancing water management, intensifying uh, biodiversity conservation and protection, and enhancing resilience to withstand impacts of climate change and disasters, including health-related disasters. SDG localization is also significant during these times as local governments have an important role in mobilizing resources and ensure no one is left behind. Solution projects in localizing SDGs are mainly to address socioeconomic and environmental issues at local level. Malaysia will also adopt the whole of nation approach that holds all stakeholders, especially the public and private sectors, civil society organizations and individuals accountable in ensuring environmental sustainability and achieving the common goals of the 2030 agenda. As such, Malaysia has delivered a national budget that benefits the people, economy and environment. The budget among others, is allocated for SDGs-related initiatives, environment-related enforcement and biodiversity conservation, as well as green financing schemes to support the development of green projects. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, we believe uh, this will be a successful meeting, particularly in identifying green recovery strategies that are practical and implementable for the Asia-Pacific countries. With stronger collaboration among countries and the right support, we can together accelerate the efforts to address the challenges and achieve the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Thank you. I thank uh, the distinguished delegate from Malaysia. I now give the floor to the distinguished delegate from China. Please take the floor. Delegate of China, we do not hear you. Have you unmuted, please? Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, quite well. Please proceed. Excuse me, uh, the delegate of, from the People's Republic of China, we do not hear you. I believe you're muted. Can you unmute your microphone, please? Can you hear me? Yes, please, please go ahead. We can hear you now. This is Sukhira at Duroy on being elected as the chair of this committee. I'm looking forward to the full result of this meeting. Now, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please go ahead. Thank you, Ambassador. The 2020 is about to pass. This year is a hard year for all mankind. The COVID-19 pandemic has spread globally, and the world economy has fallen into recession. 
This year is also a year for the world to really understand international cooperation facing global challenges such as the epidemic and pollution. The international community once again recognized that mankind is a community with a shared future. Only by working closely together, we can overcome difficulties in environment and development are the two major challenges now the world is facing today. It's the combination of all mankind to curb global warming and save the Earth. Every country and region should act as duly bound. Madam Chair, lucid the waters and lush mountains are invaluable assets. China insists on advancing the construction of ecological civilization and is building the most strict ecological system. During the 13th five-year plan, from 2016 to 2021, that is scheduled to be complete, China's ecological construction has achieved remarkable results and the eco environment has been significantly improved. I would like to list some figures here to illustrate it. In 2019, China's carbon dioxide emissions per unit of GDP was reduced by 13.2% compared to 2015 and 48.1% lower than in 2005. The national clean energy consumption accounts for 23.4% now. China's renewable energy investment has exceeded 100 billion US dollars for five years, five consecutive years. And the number of energy vehicles accounted for more than half of the world. At the end of 2019, the national clean energy concentration continued to decline, and the number of days with clear air quantity in 337 cities accounted for 82%. More than 95% of visitors have carried out clean activities and the penetration rate of sanitary toilets in rural areas has reached more than 65%. In the past 10 years, China's forest resources have increased by more than 70 million hectares, ranking number one in the world. These figures have been achieved through hard and continued efforts by the Chinese government and the Chinese people. The 15th session of the 19th Central Committee of the Communist Party of China deliberated and approved the recommendations on formulating the 14th five-year plan and the 2035 long-term goal. According to this plan, China will promote clean, no-carbon, safe, and efficient use of energy and accelerate the development of new energy, green, and environmental-friendly industries. The president of China, Mr. Xi Jinping, solemnly announced that China's new carbon dioxide emissions will be reached by 2030 and uh, uh, and the carbon neutral vision will be reached uh, by 2016. And during the general debate of the United Nations General Assembly of this year uh, was announced and the President Xi once again clarified his goal in the G20 summit and announced that China will honor its commitment and see the implementation through. Madam Chair, Asia Pacific is the end of growth. Green development will play a key role in promoting the region and make the Pacific, Asia Pacific, a leading student of global recovery. China suggests that the Asia Pacific countries can make further efforts in the following aspect. The first is strengthen the response to climate change. We should uphold the international system with the United Nations at its core and promote the full and effective implementation of Paris Agreement to address climate change under the guidance of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. The second is to promote green development. We should achieve a high quality and resilient recovery and fully utilize the potential of a new industry such as the digital economy and clean energy. And China continues to promote high quality of extensive consultation, joint contribution, and shared benefits. The third is fully promote sustainable development of all problems. The agenda for sustainable development is an important guide for the development of all countries. Environment and the development are important foundations of the sustainable development agenda. 
We must seek development opportunities during the protection of the environment and nature and achieve a win-win result with both ecological protection and sustainable development. Madam Chair, this year, facing the unexpected outbreak of pandemic, the Chinese people have achieved great strategic results in the fight against this pandemic through arduous efforts. In the meantime, China also worked with other countries by dispatching 34 medical expert teams to 32 countries and provide 282 budgets of empty academic assistance to 150 countries and four international organizations. China has strengthened its macro policy response in the first three quarters. The economic growth by 0.7 year on year and it's a foregone for conclusion to achieve positive growth in the whole year 2020. China is actively building a new development pattern in which domestic and foreign market reinforce each other with the domestic market as the main state, which will make great contributions to the better post-pandemic reconstruction and the green recovery in our region. At the APEC leaders' informal meeting, President Xi Jinping proposed to build an Asia-Pacific community with a shared vision, teaching openness, inclusiveness, innovation driving growth, great community and a mutually beneficial cooperation. The China is willing to work together with Asia-Pacific countries to actively respond to the climate change. Further promote the implementation of the sustainable future for sustainable development, thus create a new better relationship future and jointly benefit the people into the region. I thank you, Madam Chair. I thank the distinguished delegate of uh, China. Uh, before I give the, clo the floor to the distinguished uh, delegate of Maldives, may I request all uh, to limit their statement to two minutes in situation for other speakers. Thank you very much, uh, uh, the distinguished delegate of Maldives. Good morning, Madam Executive Secretary, uh, distinguished chair, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, let me congratulate the chair, Ambassador Durai, and the vice chairs, Mr. Oleg and Mr. Diki Kumar, of the sixth session of the Committee on Environment De and Development. My delegation has full confidence in their stewardship. On behalf of the Maldives delegation, I wish to express sincere appreciation for the comprehensive presentation and for the substantive reports issued under this agenda for our consideration. The year 2020 may one day be viewed as a pivotal moment in humanity's his effort to address many issues, the loudest wake-up call the world has yet received. While lockdown has been beneficial for the environment, with sharp declines in the carbon emission, COVID-19 has spared no country rich or poor by exposing the vulnerabilities of our health, social systems, and the fragility of our economies and the environment. The Maldives, a chain of coral reefs and coral islands, is custodian to one of the most diverse and unique marine biodiversity ecosystems in the world. Our reefs and islands also provide a safe haven to numerous species of migratory birds and other marine species. The economy and the livelihoods of the people of Maldives are largely dependent on the marine and coral reef biodiversity. There are few examples in the world where an entire nation's well-being is so strongly linked to its marine and natural resource base. For such a country, any threat to its biodiversity means adverse impacts on its future development. In our commitment to protect and conserve biodiversity, we have declared three atolls as biosphere reserves in order to protect biologically and ecologically significant habitats and breeding grounds. We are also protecting wetlands and mangroves and their biodiversity in the country. We have a migratory birds regulation that gives protection to all migratory species of birds, which has been in effect since 2014. The import of bird species as pets is also controlled through regulations. Madam Chair, in the recent past, Maldives has made substantial progress towards mainstreaming biodiversity concerns into national development planning. As such, we have many regulations and enacted legislation, particularly the Environmental Protection and Preservation Act, to ensure conservation of biological res resources and build the legal framework for minimizing the impacts of development practices. We have incorporated biodiversity to most of the island development plans and sector plans of all government organizations. However, mainstreaming biodiversity in the private sector and making it a priority at national level still remains a challenge. 
Maldives is working at the forefront of climate change and committed to contributing effectively to the efforts in forging common and united action. Continuous efforts are being undertaken to increase adaptation and mitigation actions and opportunities, especially for SIDS, and to undertake low emission development. The current administration intends to increase the country's share of renewable energy to 70% of the peak load by 2030. My government plans to achieve it through policy interventions and as part of achieving energy policy goals and targets to provide clean energy across the country. In September 2019, President Ibrahim Mohamed Soli also presented an ambitious initiative, the Climate Smart Resilient Islands Initiative, which calls for a holistic approach for islands to address climate change in the context of sustainable development through utilizing natural solutions, promoting innovation and new technologies with associated capacity building and enhancing access to finance. As part of this initiative, we are also opting for more sustainable ways of providing clean water and sewerage options, manage waste better, and reduce pollution on land and sea. Madam Chair, with respect to the region, regional dialogue and best practices, Maldives is practicing sustainable fisheries and working with the Indian Ocean Tuna Commission for better fish stock management. We are also collaborating with regional partners on the blue economy for sustainable use of ocean resources for socioeconomic development. Further, Maldives is exploring opportunities for collaboration in knowledge sharing, research and studies, as well as financing for protection of biodiversity, waste management, renewable energy and resource use in the country. As an import dependent country, a critical concern for us is food security. My government has embarked on strengthening food security and opt for new technology in agriculture, which is more sustainable and less harmful for the environment. The plan is to harness innovative, climate resilient technologies to achieve sustainability of rural livelihoods with a focus on climate smart agriculture and fisheries development. Despite the many strides made by the Maldives within a sh very short time frame, it is evident that Maldives has not reached its full potential and more importantly, that the benefits of this development has not reached all Mal Maldivians. A country whose livelihoods depend on the fragile natural environment remain extremely vulnerable to external economic and ex environmental shocks. As we build back our communities, economies, and institutions from the COVID-19 pandemic's impacts, let us keep in mind to prioritize our actions and put sustainability at the forefront. I thank you. I thank the distinguished delegate of Maldives. Uh, may I now request the distinguished delegate of Bhutan to take the floor. Before I do that, once again, I request all speakers to adhere to the two-minute uh, uh, time limit. Thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, you can. Please go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair, distinguished de delegates, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to thank UN, UN SCAPE and the Secretariat for convening this meeting and for the insightful reports and the documents to help us in our deliberations. The meeting program and the documents provide us an up update on the various environmental challenges that our region continue to grapple with. And these challenges are aggravated further by the COVID-19 pandemic. Countless lives and livelihood have been affected. Millions have lost jobs and economies have come to a standstill. We have been dealing with multiple shocks from both the COVID-19 pandemics and the existential threat of climate-related impacts. The world's poorest and the most vulnerable among the hardest hit global and common environmental challenges such as climate change and the current pandemic only serve to remind us that in an interconnected world, our approach to development must be holistic. The link between environment and development and the work undertaken by the committee, therefore, remains key our pursuit of SDGs 
UN 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, Bhutan is a small, least developed and landlocked developing country. We have immense development challenges. However, finding the right balance between the pursuit of Shushu economic development and protection of our environment has been at the heart of our development approach based on development philosophy of gross national happiness. We have pledged to remain carbon neutral and our constitution requires that we maintain forest coverage of at least 60% of the land. Today, our forest coverage stands at more than 70% forest cover, which not only serve as a carbon sink for greenhouse gas emissions, but also provide valuable ecosystem services. The fact that today we have been found eligible for graduation out of LDC category by the Committee for Development Policy in 2018 for the second time within a rich environment intact stands test of testimony of our approach to development. But despite all our efforts, we are victim of the impacts of climate change, extreme weather phenomena, increased frequency of natural disasters, glacial lake, lake outbursts, floods, flash floods, windstorms, landslide pools present and real danger. Climate change makes extreme weather events more frequent more intense now because of the pandemic. They come at a time when national economies are crushing and ordinary people are stretched to, to their limits. Waste management on, and water issues poses serious problems. Climate change is an existential threat that cannot be denied. The 12th five-year national development plan is critical as it is Bhutan's last plan as a LDC and will serve as our transition strategy for graduation. Efforts during the period will focus on cons consolidating past progress and addressing the remaining last mile challenges to build a strong foundation for a vibrant, resilient, sustainable economy towards achieving SDGs. However, we are extremely concerned with the extreme impacts of the COVID, which has significant and long lasting repercussion for communities, agriculture, markets, and sustainable development. Bhutan remains committed to uphold its 2009 commitment to remain carbon neutral and reaffirms its its pledge to fulfilling its commitments to the Paris Agreement for climate change. To conclude, the pandemic is rolling back the case of progress on the poverty, gender, and health. However, the pandemic gives us an opening to recover better. We now have a tremendous once in a lifetime window of opportunity for genuinely transformative green recoveries to deliver stronger climate, sustainability, health, and economic outcomes. Countries must be mindful of indiscriminate increased developmental ease post COVID and remain ourselves in the turning around from our unsustainable consumption and production patterns. Thank you, Madam Chair. I thank this, uh, the distinguished delegate of Bhutan. Uh, may I now give the floor to the distinguished uh, delegate of the Russian Federation? Uh, please go ahead. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. The year has been able to demonstrate to us насколько тесно зависит безопасность и благополучие человечества от состояния окружающей среды. Когда мы говорим об окружающей среде, 
Я лично всегда вспоминаю известную сказку Киплинга «Маугли». На мой взгляд, там есть интересный аспект. Человек смог выжить в природе, только став ее частью. Как часто мы забываем о том, что мы часть природы, а не цари природы. Вот это надо помнить. Мы, конечно, возлагаем большие надежды на площадку ИСКАТА и, в частности, ее профильный комитет по окружающей среде и развитию, как на ключевой общерегиональный механизм разработки эффективных мер и согласования подходов стран-членов комиссии к решению насущных природоохранных задач. Мы поддерживаем учреждение под эгидой комитета технической группы экспертов по окружающей среде и развитию. Это важное решение. Это может, может быть важным решением. И, надеюсь, мы примем это решение. Потому что это будет инструментом поддержания динамики и повышения эффективности текущего сотрудничества по вопросам окружающей среды в период между сессиями комитета. Разумеется, важно использовать в нашей будущей работе уже имеющиеся достижения ИСКАТа в налаживании региональных связей для решения проблем в таких областях, как сохранение экосистемы биоразнообразия, устойчивое управление природными ресурсами, устойчивое потребление производства, consumption and production. Сельское хозяйство, борьба с загрязнением воздуха, адаптация и митигация глобального изменения климата. Я хотел бы сказать, что важную роль в этих усилиях выполняет такой механизм сотрудничества, как не аспект. Там ведется очень важная практическая работа. Речь, в частности, о сохранении тигров, леопардов. Кроме того, хотели бы отметить те усилия, частью которых являются российские эксперты по борьбе с загрязнением воздуха. Партнерство Северо-Восточной Азии «Чистый воздух». Мы, конечно, поддерживаем региональное сотрудничество в сфере противодействия изменению климата и адаптации к нему. При этом, говоря о глобальном, из... При этом, говоря о глобальном изменении климата, необходимо не забывать, что основное международное взаимодействие по данной проблематике ведется, как мы все знаем, на площадке рамочной конвенции об изменении климата и Парижского соглашения. UNFCCC and Paris Agreement. Наши усилия должны сверяться с теми консенсусными решениями, которые формируются под эгидой UNFCCC PRC and Paris Agreement. Путем реализации адресных проектов тех содействий Россия активно участвует в работе ИСКАТа по оказанию экспертной помощи странам-членам в выполнении обязательств Парижского соглашения по климату. Еще один важный момент, прежде чем я завершу свое выступление. В контексте идей, которые высказываются при обсуждении подходов к природно-охранной политике, Фигурирует так называемая концепция охраны здоровья планеты. Мы хотели бы четко обозначить. 
и хотели бы, чтобы коллеги нас услышали, и эксперты секретариата услышали. Эта концепция является лишь одним из обсуждаемых на международных площадках вариантов. Она не является согласованным документом. Там есть много вопросов. А в этой связи а, мы считаем, что преждевременно было бы думать и говорить, it's not a bit early, it's a quite early, а, что можно было бы говорить о ее консолидированном продвижении на площадке Иската. А, уважаемая госпожа председатель, хотелось бы все-таки завершить на позитивной ноте. Мы видим, что коронавирусная пандемия, как уже говорили многие здесь в этом зале и виртуально на экранах, она является своего рода предупреждением природы человечеству. Надо прислушаться к этому звонку. Услышать, мы должны услышать этот звонок. Вместе с тем, год прошедший нас научил, что международная солидарность, взаимопомощь, коллективные усилия, объединение, а не разъединение усилий, способны противостоять глобальным угрозам. Спасибо. I thank the distinguished uh, representative of the Russian Federation. I now give the floor to the distinguished uh, representative of Japan with the request once again to adhere to the time limit. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, ladies and gentlemen. Ironically, coronavirus increases the use of disposal of plas plastic products such as masks, protective gears, face curves, and that reassures that plastic materials still play an important role in society. Having Osaka Blue Ocean vision of G20 last year in our mind, marine plastic litter remains an issue that requires urgent action. If we consider the negative impact that the issue continues to have on marine diversity, people's li li livelihood, fisheries, tourism, and the shipping industry. On September 3rd this year, Japan hosted the ministerial meeting of the online platform for sustainable and resilient recovery from COVID-19. With participants from 96 countries, including 40, 46 ministers and deputy ministers, this meeting is the largest online global conference related to climate change. And me this meeting succeeded in sharing and advocating commitment and concrete actions concerning the double crisis of coronavirus and climate change. Madam Chair, while COP26 was put up until November 2021, Japan, we believe through such conference, consolidated international solidarity and contributed to keeping and gaining momentum for tackling climate change. Thank you. Thank you very much, the distinguished uh, delegate of Japan. May I now give the floor to the distinguished uh, delegate of the Republic of Korea. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Excellencies, distinguished uh, delegate, uh, on behalf of the government, I would like to convey our gratitude to Madam Chair and ESCA for hosting this important meeting despite daunting challenges. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, climate change, and environmental degradation all share a common cause, climate crises. In this regard, Korea sympathizes with the diagnosis that the planetary health approach should be the starting point of our solution, and that this approach should serve as the basis to build back better and greener from the pandemic. This guiding principle needs to be supported by specific and actionable implementation strategies, 
as mentioned in the helpful and useful document of the agenda, Korea has embarked on the journey of Green New Deal, a greener, more sustainable and inclusive recovery with the aim toward carbon neutrality by 2050. Korea's Green New Deal is an action oriented five year fiscal package that will help us overcome the current economic and climate crisis. The Green New Deal focuses on three key areas, namely green transition of urban and living infrastructure, decarbonization and decentralization of energy, and green industry innovation, along with considerations for regional balance and social safety net. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, as pointed out in the document, global solidarity as well as regional collaboration is crucial to ensure that we do not revert back to the business as usual before the pandemic. To that end, Korea plans to actively share the experiences of Green New Deal and 2050 carbon neutrality strategy and to fully support the developing countries in the Asia Pacific region with their recovery efforts. In particular, the Seoul Initiative Network on Green Growth has provided development support since 2006 together with UNFPAP, and now it will be in its fourth phase for 2021 with specific focus on helping the countries tackle climate change and build better, better and green. Also, together with FPAP, Korea plans to support better air quality management in the region using the Korea geostationary environmental monitoring setup, thereby contributing to the planetary health. Distinguished that way, as the paper clearly points out, we need to stay to the wake of call for the planet so that we can gather ourselves toward the path of green, sustainable, and inclusive recovery. Korea stands ready to provide further support. Thank you, Madam Chair. I thank the distinguished delegate of the Republic of Korea. I now give the floor to the distinguished delegate of uh, Bangladesh. Thank you very much uh, for giving me the opportunity to speak something uh, regarding the Bangladesh issue. First of all, uh, Honorable Chairperson, I want to mention the point given by Honorable Under Secretary of the United Nations in her speech that uh, she <coughs> called to raise the climatic ambition, keeping her main theme in mind, we have taken a lot of decisions to raise our climatic ambition. Uh, we are at uh, revising our NDC and it is about to be submitted uh, very soon. Under all scenario described in the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change 2018, a special report on 1.5 degrees centigrade, global net anthropogenic greenhouse gas emission must fall 45% by 2030 and reach net zero around 2050. IPCC indicates that urgent and transformative action is necessary to keep global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius or below to achieve the sustainable development goals and the countries are unanimously agreed to work toward global goals that world limit global average temperature rise under the Paris Agreement. The main principle of Paris Agreement is that we, no country should backslide on its intention. Keeping that in mind, we have already, uh, Bangladesh has taken the chairmanship of Climate Vulnerable Forum, that is CBF. Right at the moment, we are, uh, Bangladesh is uh, taking the um, chairmanship of CBF and at the same time vulnerable 20, most vulnerable group of this uh, 
area that is V20 and at the same time we have taken a lot of actions. Uh, the Global Center on Adaptation has been established at Dhaka uh, during last September, which was inaugurated by Honorable Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina under the leadership of Sheikh Hasina. And we, in response to innovative solution of climate, the adaptation, uh, we are working a lot in locally lot adaptation work. Uh, Bangladesh is on the verge of uh, um, formulating the BCCSC, that is Bangladesh Climate Change Strategic Action Plan, and at the same time, National Action Plan. And perhaps this is the first country, Bangladesh is the first country in that region that has formulated Bangladesh Climate Change and Gender Action Plan, which we are implementing right at the moment. We are spending 1% of our total GDP in climate change, and it is uh, last year we spent two billion in the climate sector. So we are a lot of working uh, are going on, and finally, uh, we, the Bangladesh, strongly endorse the formation of technical expert group. That is decision number one, and also expressing the interest of Bangladesh in participation in that technical expert group. Thank you all. I thank the distinguished delegate of uh, Bangladesh, and I now give the floor to the distinguished delegate of India. I must confess I've been very indulgent with all speakers, but I'm not going to be indulgent with you. So please be short and snappy. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the floor, Madam Chair. Madam Chair and distinguished delegates, India has a culture of not just conserving and protecting nature, but living in harmony with nature. The emergence of COVID-19 pandemic has emphasized the fact that unregulated exploitation of natural resources coupled with unsustainable food habits and consumption pattern lead to destruction system that supports human life. India believes that if you protect nature, nature will protect you. As far as India is concerned, according to Climate Action Tracker, India is among the top five countries whose actions are on track to keep global warming below two degrees Celsius target. As our environment minister said, we are walking the talk on our commitments related to climate change. Our strategy includes reduction in emission intensity by percentage of GDP, increase of non-fossil fuel based power such as renewable energy and creation of additional carbon sink. I'm also pleased to inform this committee that in the course of last decade, India has enhanced the combined forest and tree cover to 24.56 of the total geographical area of the country. India aims to restore 26 million hectares of degraded and deforested land and achieve land degradation neutrality by 2030. This is a target which shows our ambition. India is advancing on a broad front to ensure a clean energy future for its people, which is drawn from its civilizational attributes. As far as India is concerned, there is also an active and vibrant civic society, which is promoting citizens' awareness of the threat of climate change. To keep it short and to conclude, I would like to add that regarding the technical expert group on environment and development, India wishes that, proposes that the TEG should have adequate representation from the member countries of UNSCAP. Further, the working of such group should be transparent and inclusive. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. all. I thank the distinguished uh, delegate of uh, India for that statement and for saving our reputation. I now give the floor to the Asia Pacific Research Network.
Um, I think uh, uh, I will now give the floor to the next first uh, group, which is requested, which is the International Federation of Social Workers. You have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, excellencies, distinguished delegates and fellow participants, thank you for this opportunity. I represent the International Federation of Social Workers, which is the global professional body for social workers. With over 141 member countries representing over 3 million social workers globally, we are on the front lines of human rights and social protection with a shared commitment to human rights, self-determination, climate and social justice. We welcome this opportunity and commend ESCAP and the committee for recognising climate action as one of the core strategies for achieving sustainability and also realising the 2030 Agenda and the SDGs. The IFSW supports the committee's statement that the pandemic has served as a wake-up call, underscoring the importance of strengthening and accelerating environmental action. As with climate change, COVID-19 has disproportionately affected marginalised populations, further entrenching poverty and inequality. Climate change is the greatest challenge that we all face, and as social workers, we are united in our call for immediate action from every actor in the region and across the world. The changes confronting our environment because of global warming are already profound and extensive, making climate policy an urgent responsibility for member states, especially in the Asia Pacific region. We need to shift rapidly away from fossil fuels towards cleaner, healthier and safer forms of energy. Social workers see firsthand the impacts of inaction and the need for systemic long-term solutions for the well-being of the entire ecosystem, including humans, for current and future generations. For social workers, climate action is inherently a social justice issue, and this is why the SDGs are so vital, as they recognise that climate action and sustainability are only possible if we address social inequality. We urgently need member states to act and ensure we have a healthy and sustainable environment. Member states need to create strong collaborative national frameworks that focus on poverty eradication and sustainable development. There also needs to be far greater transparency and accountability as many, many member states in the region have been the barriers to climate action and it has become increasingly the responsibility of the NGO sector to address this inaction. As a core part of our practice, social workers understand that meaningful social and environmental action can only be achieved if people's voices are heard and they have influence over their own lives. Climate action requires a whole of society approach and member states must be willing to develop meaningful partnerships and networks. We call on all member states to work in partnership and collaboration with communities, civil society, NGO and professional groups to achieve meaningful and sustainable change and to work with and learn from Indigenous peoples in the region. If we are to achieve the SDGs, the uh, decade of action needs to start with a fundamental shift towards a collaborative and bottom-up approach to assure we have a sustainable world for generations to come. Thank you. I thank the distinguished uh, representative of uh, IFSW uh, and I now give the floor to the distinguished uh, representative of the Asia Pacific Research Network. Thank you so much, Madam Chair and uh, distinguished excellencies. Thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to speak in this um, meeting. I am Jasmina Lumang. I am the Secretary General of the Asia Pacific Research Network. And I am also the co one of the co-chairs of the Asia Pacific Regional CSO Engagement Mechanism which is composed of 610 civil society organizations in in 18 constituencies and in 38 countries all over Asia Pacific. We just came from the recently concluded People's Forum on uh, with the theme systemic change and solidarity are the only antidotes for the COVID-19 pandemic. And I'm I'm so happy to, to share with you some of the our recommendations uh, it, uh, from this meeting. First of all, uh, I'm happy to hear that many of the things that we've been trying to tell you in the last several years are now being discussed in this forum. The means of implementation is very crucial in, 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 in addressing the systemic barriers that we have been telling everyone. 
in all forums from the national, regional, and even at the global forum. However, we, we really need to underscore, you know, the, the, the policy coherence question that, that, is, um, that needs to be addressed in, by the United Nations and even the governments in different countries in Asia Pacific. The reason being because, um, for example, we are we support uh, the um, the recommendation for uh, the technical working group, and we hope that this body will also include civil society organizations, because especially indigenous peoples who have traditional knowledge about you know how to deal with uh, zoonotic diseases and 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 and, and stuff. And in the context of the digital divide, um, we are so uh, happy that uh, UNSCAP has given us the opportunity to discuss our concerns regarding having virtual meetings like this. Because uh, as you know, we struggled with it, you know, not only because we do not know KUDO, but also we do not have internet access in many places. And so we welcome the efforts of our uh, Madam Executive Secretary to have a meeting with us, uh, with the advisory committee of the permanent representative and other representatives designated by members of the commission. And in relation to the discussions here, uh, I hope that we also look at the other policy coherent issues like the the regional trade agreements you know the, the recent regional agreements that were signed by the ASEAN countries the RCEP has many implications for us and uh the discussions around uh the you know the the waiver for for the trips uh agreement you know, for the prevention and containment of treatment of COVID-19 in the, in the TRIPS agreement that was uh, uh, lobbied by uh, our, our governments from India and Pakistan. We support that. Thank you very much. When uh, pharmaceutical companies will be in the position to dictate the vaccine pricing and, 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 and of course, there's really a need for a moratorium on the ISDS clauses at the, at the very least during this pandemic because we know that uh, transnational corporations, multinational corporations alike are ready to sue governments who are, you know, uh, violating uh, the ISDS clause. So these are very key recommendations that we would like that this this committee will will look into. And also uh, in relation to the preparations for the UNEA, our environmental working group is currently um, discussing how we can engage uh, more strongly, uh, particularly since we're only given. Uh, a few days, just one day, for 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 meetings. Uh, we hope that you know this this virtual meetings will also give us the opportunity to to engage more with you because um, we appreciate that we are able to do this at the regional level, but at the national level we are very very challenged. And so we hope that uh, our our distinguished excellencies, no, uh, especially though we support the 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 recommendations and the statements that were made by the distinguished uh, delegate from Ru the Russian Federation and also Bhutan for for the imp for the importance of of partnerships and and we understand that we also have a stake in this not only because we are we are part of the global community as civil society although we are not part of government we are non-state actors and we are part of the private sector but then we still need to discuss a lot of things in terms of moving forward like the role of the so uh, the small medium enterprises may i uh, sorry to interrupt may i request uh, the distinguished representative of uh, the asia pacific research network uh, 
to quickly conclude her statement we fully understand your concerns thank you thank you so much madam and and finally to wrap up uh, i'd like to thank you for giving us this opportunity uh, to speak and we hope to to have more conversations with you in the future especially in the lead up to the uh, unia uh, meetings next year thank you so much thank you uh, may I now give the floor to the distinguished representative of WHO, the Southeast Asia Regional Office. Thank you, Chair. Uh, excellencies, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen. I thank the Secretariat for the background paper on environmental and development in the aftermath of the coronavirus pandemic in the Asia Pacific region, outlining the initiatives and actions for considerations by the committee. Allow me to also congratulate Madam Chair and Vice Chairs for your election as office bearers of the session and look forward to fruitful outcomes from the session. COVID-19 pandemic is the greatest global shock in decades. Hundreds of thousands of lives have been lost and the world's economy likely faces the worst recession since the 1930s. The resulting loss of employment and income will cause further damage to livelihoods, health and sustainable development. The pandemic has served as a wake up call underscoring the importance of strengthening and accelerating environmental action. The concept of planetary health is more of essential in the response to the call guide, guiding COVID-19 recovery efforts at the regional level. Planetary health can also guide whole of government approaches to COVID-19 recovery efforts at all levels and to specific sectoral policies. Recognizing the vulnerability of the Southeast Asia region to climate change and related extreme weather events, the ministers of health have signed the Malay Declaration on building health systems resilience to climate change at the 70th Regional Committee meeting held in September 2017, assessing vulnerability of healthcare facilities to climate risks and developing plans and procedures to improve the resilience of the facilities and system is one of the key actions of the Malaya Declaration. WHO has implemented multiple support programs to member states, which includes assessing climate change and health vulnerability and developing adoption options, development of health components of national adaptation plans, implementation of projects in countries across all WHO regions, aiming to strengthen the resilience of their health systems and integration of climate weather variables into surveillance systems of climate sensitive diseases and health, health outcomes. Madam Chair, participants, ladies and gentlemen, societies need to protect themselves and to recover as quickly as possible strategies for a longer term recovery in the wake of COVID-19 to promote a greener, more equal and resilient future aligned with the principles of planetary health and sustainable development is essential. To achieve the highest attainable uh, standard of health, well-being, equity worldwide, recovery strategies should give attention on humanity's political, economic and social and the safe environmental limits within which it can flourish. Governments need to create strong national frameworks to embed biodiversity and ecosystem services into the disease prevention, poverty eradication and sustainable development agendas. Regional platforms and networks that support raising climate ambition in Asia and the Pacific and tackling of air pollution as shared risks and responsibilities should be further strengthened. Regional capacity building and dialogue on best practices and development of knowledge products and best buys must always be promoted. In view of those challenges and opportunities presented, WHO reiterates and support the actions forwarded by the committee as, they are, as these are all in line with the central policy prescriptions of WHO's manifesto for a healthy and green recovery from COVID-19 and call upon member states and partners to implement the manifesto for a healthy and green recovery from COVID-19 while also focusing on achieving the sustainable development goals. We wish for successful deliberations and outcomes. I thank you. I thank uh, the distinguished delegate of uh, WHO uh, for his statement. I now give the floor to the distinguished representative of the International Atomic Energy Agency. Uh, I request you to strictly abide by the time limit of uh, two minutes. Thank you very much.
Excellencies, distinguished delegates, Madam Chair, good afternoon. Allow me please to congratulate ESCAP and Her Excellency for the high attention to the environment and development. Madam Chair, distinguished delegates, for several decades within its statute and mandate, Atoms for Peace and Development, the IAEA as a science-based organization of the UN family has been with uh, supporting its member states to develop specialized expertise, networks, infrastructure, and capacity that can be used in complementarity with conventional techniques to help address various environmental and marine contaminations and their associated problems. The IAEA Technical Cooperation Program supports socioeconomic development and contributes to the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals. Addressing so many of its key challenges like climate change, food and energy security, pollution of the oceans and seas, and human health. The IAEA supported 127 countries and territories with more than 1,800 orders for equipment for COVID-19 detection and diagnosis and other supplies that have been delivered right, to 127 countries and territories. To be better prepared for the future, the IAA launched the Zoonotic Disease Integrated Action, Zodiac, a project to strengthen countries' preparedness and capabilities to respond to the threats of zoonotic diseases. Zodiac includes a new interregional project on supporting national and regional capacity in integrated action for control of zoonotic diseases, which has just been approved by the IAA Board of Governors. This is aimed to build global, regional, and national capabilities for the surveillance, detection, and control of emerging and re-emerging zoonotic diseases. Plastic pollution is another challenge facing us, threatening ecosystems, imperiling food safety, and affecting human health. Nuclear technology can contribute innovative solutions to this global challenge, both upstream in plastic mitigation at the source and downstream as we apply nuclear technology to monitor and assess the impact of microplastics in the marine environment. Several countries in Asia and the Pacific already have some advanced capabilities and initiatives that can offer and move towards the solution of this global issue. The IAEA therefore has launched a new initiative, Nuclear Technology for Controlling Plastic Pollution, or new tech plastic, which will gradually integrate nuclear technology into initiatives at every level that address the plastic challenge. Since 2012, the IAEA has invested over 10 million for 24 technical cooperation projects to establish laboratories, train counterparts, and develop regulations for marine contamination control. For the program forthcoming for 22-23 alone, the IAEA member states have various projects related to this. Madam Chair, I would like to conclude to express our strong interest and to look in supporting the initiatives related to the environment and development as part of our program and look forward to our collaboration for a synergy towards a comprehensive and convergent actions to address current and emergent environmental challenges. I wish uh, success for the meeting. Thank you. I thank the distinguished representative of uh, IAEA. Uh, we do not see any other requests. Uh, so I would like to conclude this session by thanking all of you for your contributions and uh, for this excellent segment. And I will now hand over to the secretary of the committee for some housekeeping announcements. 
Thank you very much, Madam Chair, uh, and also thank you for your excellent moderation. Excellencies, uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, the committee will reconvene at 1500 hours Bangkok time for agenda item three. A list of the documentation is indicated uh, in your agenda. We kindly request uh, those joining through KUDO to return early to test and ensure that their connections are working properly. Uh, for those here at the Conference Center, the International Cafeteria is open on the first floor and Roger Pruick Lounge is open on the ground floor. floor. Uh, please respect physical distancing as you depart ESCAP Hall and we shall see you back here at 3 p.m. Thank you very much.